Welcome to the History of Witchcraft. Episode 30. The Lynching of John Lamb. Who rules the kingdom? The king. Who rules the king? The duke. Who rules the duke? The devil. Let the duke look to it, for they intend shortly to use him worse than they did the doctor, and if things be not shortly reformed, they will work a reformation themselves. Let Charles and George do what they can. The duke shall die like Dr. Lamb. Excerpts from two anonymous London pamphlets, 1628. Welcome back to the history of witchcraft. Last week, we saw how the English legal system had lost any zealotry it might have once had by the reign of Charles I. The role of the royal court in this development was certainly significant, as the English judiciary was remarkably centralised compared to its neighbours, but change had been in the air for decades. The Anglican Church, now firmly established, had little interest in pandering to the zealotry found in both recalcitrant Catholics or radical Puritans, and rightly or wrongly, these denominations were associated with mad and irresponsible witch hunts. Legal practice was itself becoming more rational, with judicial manuals more and more prioritising evidence, and cross-examined witnesses and relying less on reputation alone. All of these factors help explain the steady decline in witch hunts throughout the early Stuart era. Of course, there is one rather significant road bump in this narrative of general decline. After all, we are just over a decade away from the time of the Witchfinder General, and I am excited to get to Mr Hopkins and Mr Stern. For now, though, we will have to wait. I had planned to begin the episodes on the War of the Three Kingdoms this week, but the sheer volume of scholarship I have to get through has pushed me back somewhat. So instead, we will have a relatively short episode covering the life and death of a figure that I wanted to cover but couldn't quite fit to the narrative. John Lamb. John Lamb was born in either 1545 or 1546 in the English county of Worcestershire to unknown parents. According to the pamphlets that appeared after his death, and which portray him in a terrible light, he seems to have been learned enough to teach the children of local gentry. Where Lamb began to stray was when he began to practice medicine, whereupon he took the title of doctor and began treating patients. Going further, Dr. Lamb took up more esoteric arts. He began to tell fortunes and claimed he could discover lost property diagnose the ailments of people he had never met, and could tell whether someone was or was not a witch. He could show young people the faces of their future spouses in a crystal glass, whether it was ball-shaped or not, I can't tell, and revealing, quote, to wives the escapes and faults of their husband, and to their husbands of their wives. All of these services, of course, came at a price, and the good doctor managed to make quite a living off the credulity and marriage problems of his clients. Lamb appears to have had a relatively successful career as a physician and conjurer for decades. We have no record of Lamb in a brush with the law until as late as 1608. It was in May of this year that Lamb was accused in the Worcestershire diseases of using, quote, evil, devilish, and execrable arts to disable, make infirm, and consume the body and strength of the said Thomas, Lord Windsor. In addition to this charge, Lamb was also accused of invoking spirits. One Mr. Wayneman testified that when he had spoken to Dr. Lamb, the good doctor was able to read him like a book. He knew his life story despite being strangers, he could point to scars and marks on Wayneman's body that were hidden by clothes, and promised that he could do the same to others. Apparently, in an attempt to convince a prospective client of his services, Lamb summoned a spirit within a crystal glass, at which point the doctor professed his love for the diabolic entity. Wayneman then ran away in terror of what he'd seen, although he clearly got over his fear because he testified of another time when he'd spoken to Lamb after this. Here, 
Lamb had offered his services to, quote, intoxicate, poison, and bewitch any man so as they should be disabled from begetting of children, end quote. Lamb seems to have been held throughout his trial in Worcester Castle, which sadly no longer exists, where he quite happily demonstrated his skills to visitors, which was probably not the best idea when you're on trial for sorcery. One such tale is of three men who visited Lamb late in the day and asked for some wine. When they were told that none was available and that none could be ordered due to the lateness, Lamb asked what type of wine they wanted. When they answered, he called out for a wine glass and it immediately appeared on the table, full to the brim with a requested wine, with the stamp of a local tavern on its side. Another tells of Lamb telling his company that he would make a nearby woman that they could see from the window lift her skirt. To their shock, she did, and when people around her, quote, asked what she meant by so shameless a behaviour, she answered them that she meant to wade through the water and save her clothes, imagining, it should seem, that there had been a pool where it was dry land, end quote. The charge against Lamb for bewitching Lord Windsor was suspended, while the charge of invoking spirits was stayed. And then perhaps the most dramatic part of this story occurred. Within two weeks of the suspension of the trial proceedings, more than 40 people involved in the trial of Dr. Lamb died. These included sheriffs, justices of the peace, witnesses and jury members, and just local gentry who'd attended. According to the late Dr. Anita McConnell, the most likely cause of the deaths was an infectious disease, such as typhus, also known as jail fever, which could have spread quite happily in the close confines of the court. It is of no surprise, however, that local opinion immediately blamed the good doctor for the deaths. This was his revenge against those who had wronged him. So it did not take long for a petition to call for Lamb to be transferred to London, which he was. Now, what happened next is unclear. Lamb seems to have been imprisoned in the King's Bench Jail for a number of years, but still had substantial liberty and came into significant wealth over the next few years. Yet there's no mention in the sources that he was ever pardoned. It seems like business continued as normal for Lamb. He practiced medicine and his mystical arts, or at least pretended to, and had employees making clothes in his jailhouse rooms. At one point, he met the man who would change his life, and not necessarily for the better. George Villiers, Duke of Buckingham, had become the patron of Lamb, employing his services and knowledge. We've met Villiers before. He was the favourite of King James, and firm ally of Charles, going so far as to join him in his clandestine mission to Spain to forge the marriage alliance between the Prince and the Infanta. On the 13th of June, 1623, Lamb was indicted for the rape of an 11-year-old girl called Joan Seeger, who had been sent to his rooms to deliver some herbs when the 77-year-old doctor was accused of assaulting her. The jury found him guilty, and the judge sentenced him to death for his crime. Yet, the Lord Chief Justice James Lay possibly on his own initiative, or possibly at the urging of Lamb's powerful friends, questioned the strength of the case. It was revealed that young Joan's father was in significant debt to Lamb, and the doctor had demanded payment only a few weeks before the first accusation was levelled. Faced with this revelation, on the 4th of June 1624, Lay pardoned Lamb, of the crime on the grounds that the accusation was false and driven by financial motives. Now finally pardoned, which seems to have included his Worcestershire convictions, Lamb moved out of the King's Bench Jail and rented a house near Parliament for over a year. Now, Buckingham may have played a role in Lamb's pardon, but he was a dangerous friend to have. Buckingham was unpopular, to say the least. He was thought to have an unnatural power over the king, possibly of a magical sort, and had pushed for, and led, disastrous military campaigns on the continent. His consorting with a figure as maligned as Dr. John Lamb hardly helped his reputation, and the same was true for Lamb himself. To the commons, if the duke held power over the king, it was through his employment of Lamb. Their equally poor reputations multiplied with each other. 
In June 1626, a bizarre storm swept up the Thames, which the pamphlets claim ripped corpses out of churchyards and lifted the mist from Buckingham's residence. Lamb was said to have been seen on the Thames itself, marshalling the weather. Around the same time, Buckingham's mother asked Lamb to tell her son's fortune. He is said to have shown her, in his crystal ball, a man with a dagger. Now, the accuracy of this claim is particularly questionable. Prophecies that actually tell the future tend to be fabricated after the events themselves, and since Buckingham would indeed meet his death at the hands of a man and a dagger, this certainly falls under that category. Rumours circled that Lamb, now close to 80 years old, was the lover of Buckingham's sister-in-law, providing her with charms, although this is seriously doubtful. Lady Purbeck was the centre of something of a scandal in Stuart, England, accused of adultery with the son of the Earl of Suffolk, and it appears to have been Buckingham himself who pushed for her to be tried for adultery and accused her of witchcraft. Why would Lamb go against the wishes of his patron in such direct way? Such was the reputation of Lamb that even now he was dogged by the claims made against him 20 years previously. In December of 1627, he was accused of sorcery and for trying to persuade a Westminster scholar, quote, to give himself to the devil, end quote, and he was again imprisoned. It was at this time that Lamb's fraudulent services were exposed. He had repeatedly claimed that he had been licensed by the Bishop of Durham to practice as a physician and had been granted the title of doctor. Yet, when examined by the College of Physicians while imprisoned, it was discovered that he had no knowledge of the language of medicine or of how to actually practice. It is possible that the septuagenarian doctor's mental faculties weren't what they used to be, or that the discipline and methods had changed or developed since he was trained, but Lamb went on to admit that he was indeed conning people in order to earn a living. He had nothing but lucky guesses when peddling both medicine and sorcery. Sometime between this examination and June 1628, Lamb must have been released, for on the 13th of June he went to the theatre. Yet he was of such ill repute that he was recognised by a crowd of people that followed him when he left. Obviously a bit concerned about the heckling group, Lamb paid some sailors, probably of the intimidating sort, to act as his guards while he ate supper at a tavern. When he left, he took his guards with him, and now the outright hostile crowd pelted him with stones as he ran. The doctor took shelter in another tavern, while the guards faced the wrath of the crowd, but the tavern keeper was not willing to risk his life and livelihood by sheltering someone like Lamb. The doctor was made to leave, and he managed to sneak into a neighbouring house, only to be discovered and ejected by the mob. It was at this point, surrounded by dozens of angry Londoners, that the title of today's episode came to pass. The crowd stoned and beat the doctor until he fell unconscious, and he was taken to a nearby lockhouse, where, early in the morning, on the 14th of June, 1628, Dr. John Lamb died of his wounds. No one was ever brought to trial for Lamb's death, despite the royal court bringing significant pressure upon the local authorities. Lamb was part of Buckingham's retinue, and was well liked by the king himself. When no progress had been made, the court imposed a thousand pound fine on the city companies. The Duke of Buckingham would not have long to mourn his magician. He would be stabbed to death by an army officer just weeks later. So like I said, today's episode was quite short, but hopefully you found the story of John Lamb as interesting as I did. It didn't quite fit in with the general narrative, so I didn't think I'd have a chance to talk about him, but here we are. Before we leave off, I have two very important announcements. First, as of recording this episode, the history of witchcraft has surpassed 100,000 downloads. That's amazing. That's simply amazing. Thank you. All of you, for that. I'm so happy I'm not just rambling into the void for no reason. I really enjoy podcasting, and it's made all the better for knowing that there are people listening. Secondly, I am hosting an AMA, an Ask Me Anything, on Reddit's History subreddit. 
If you haven't heard of or seen an AMA before, it's basically a massive Q&A session where the questions are posed by users. Usually, they're in their own dedicated subreddit for AMAs, but specialized subreddits such as R History often host their own due to their specific audience interests. And that's where I come in. I'll be hosting my AMA at 5pm here in the UK or 1pm Eastern Time on Wednesday the 25th of April and answering questions for about 3 hours or so. I'll be putting a link to the thread on Twitter and Facebook when it goes live, which will take you right to it. Or otherwise just go to reddit.com slash r slash history at that time and date. I can't guarantee I'll answer every question, there are close to 13 million readers of our history after all, but I will certainly give it a shot. So again, that will be at 5pm UTC on Wednesday the 25th, and I'll post all over social media when it begins. Thank you to Hammer of the Witches, executed today, Witchfinder General Michelle G, and the Inquisitors Trish G, Elaine D, and to all of my demonologists and theologians for supporting the show through Patreon. You can join their ranks by visiting the show's Patreon page at patreon.com slash historyofwitchcraft. If you've enjoyed the episode, please consider leaving me a positive review on iTunes, Stitcher, or whichever podcast app you use. You can visit the website at thehistoryofwitchcraft.co.uk, where you will find my contact details if you have any questions. The show also has a Facebook page and a Twitter feed if you want to keep up to date. The intro and outro music have been provided by Sounds Like an Earful. Thank you again for listening.